Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast. I'm Tudor Dixon, and I'm glad you're joining me today because I am super excited about our guest. He grew up in Brooklyn, the son of a single mom, graduated from Florida State, and now he's a congressman for Florida's 19th District, Congressman Byron Donalds. Thank you for joining me today. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Absolutely. I'm, I am excited, too, because just before we got on, we started talking about elections and what we need to be doing for elections. And you said something really interesting to me. You talked about punditry and how people keep coming out and saying they know everything. But really, there's some things that we're not doing, isn't, aren't there? I totally agree. I, I look, at the midterm elections was really interesting to me. Um, a couple of things. One, I just, I understand the value of political consultants. I'm not trying to downgrade political consultants, but they don't know all and they don't see all. And the number one thing that we really weren't seeing was, you know, all of our polling packages were saying the big four issues were crime, immigration, you know, the economy, you know, you know, the border, like that, that, uh, you know, uh, stuff going on in schools, uh, you know, the the gender transitioning stuff, which has been disastrous for students, closing schools, the Democrats did. And I'm not discounting any of that. I think those were all major issues in America, still are actually. But one of the key issues uh, that's that's really hurt us is how the left has weaponized uh, college students. And I'm really focusing on college age voters with respect to abortion. And it's something Mm. where as a party, we didn't have a message. We didn't have a strategy. Um, It's something that we just looked at polling and said, oh, well, that's issue number seven. Uh, But yeah, for most voters in the midterm election, it is issue number seven. But the Democrats found a way to weaponize college students with it. And they turned them out in large numbers. And that's in part one of them. That's actually the biggest reason uh, the midterm elections didn't turn out the way we had anticipated. Absolutely. And and I think that there are a lot of people who felt like Roe v. Wade was overturned and that was a huge win. And so there was this false sense of security on the life side of things where, I mean, I know that even folks I was talking to on the life side of things, because that's obviously that was a big issue in my race, Mm. were saying, no, 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 we've got this. And even when when I tried to have that conversation of you know, this just doesn't seem like this is the heart space of the people. I've traveled all across the state. At that point, I had talked to Christian moms, strong Christian moms who took me aside and said, you can't take this away from our daughters. And no matter how often I said, it's up to the people because in Michigan, it was on the ballot. It was an incredibly effective tool to threaten people. You know, this is going to be taken away from you. I heard someone recently say, once you've gotten to a certain number of years with an issue, it is really hard to change that heart space. And it's not necessarily legislation, it's culture. It's everything that that folks believe. So I've had people come after me and say, do you really think that this many women want to kill their babies? I don't think that's it at all. I think it's it, they, they see it as a right and it, it's becomes the norm. And as much as people hate to think that that's become the norm, it's really hard to say you're going to have one politician come in and be the savior of all this. We were at 24 to 26 weeks. A lot of states could have said, OK, now Roe v. Wade is overturned. We're going to go somewhere between between 10 and 15 weeks. And that would have been saving a lot of life. But I know that there's a feeling that you have to save all or nothing. And and that just doesn't seem the heart heart space of the country right now. Well, look, the first thing is is that, you know, we want to do everything possible to save every life. I think abortion Mm -hmm. has really been a scourge in our country, Um, Mm -hmm. especially in the black communities. The the amount of babies that have been aborted, um, just think about the, the black population in America could have actually grown substantially over that time. Uh, so it's been a very personal topic, very uh, divisive topic in our in our country. Uh, but the one thing you are correct in is that for 50 years, the left has positioned this issue as if it's a right without balancing it amongst the other rights, like the right of the unborn to live, uh, the right for, you know, the right for a lot of other things. And so when they've done that, frankly, unfortunately, quite successfully, for so long, you have a lot of people who really believe that to be the case. So my view is that it's going to take time for the country to understand uh, the new politics of abortion and what that sweet spot is. Um, and it's really going to take time, I think, you know, for pro-life activists to see the world they want to see, because people now have to live in the new reality of the 50 states 
making decisions. And so it takes time for the politics of that to center around where the culture is. Um, ben Shapiro, love him, listen to him a lot. He always says, you know, politics is downstream from culture. Abortion is no different. And the, right. the tragedy in the United States is abortion has become a part of our culture. The positives are, is that there are a lot of young people who are actually pro-life. Like they want to save lives. They want to have their children. They don't want to seek abortion. And so I think that it's going to take us time to move into this this new realm of the, the, the new politics, I guess you would say, of abortion and what that means in the United States. I think where it's really going to end up is California. It's frankly going to be abortion till birth and same as New York, uh, maybe same as Oregon and Washington State, um, Mississippi, Alabama. It's going to be no, we're not, we're not, we're not allowing abortions or six weeks, like which is the law in Florida now, or 10 weeks in some states. And you're really going to have a hybrid approach. What I think is going to happen is America is going to slowly downshift much more to what the, what the standards are in, in Europe, which is where you have anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks. And in some states, it's going to be less than that. Well, I think that's something that folks need to understand is that this this is an ongoing battle. It's an ongoing discussion between the both both of the sides. And that, like I said, just because Roe v. Wade was overturned, that didn't mean that abortion was gone. It, was, it certainly is something that has become ingrained in our culture. And that's something that if you want to start saving life, you have to save life over time. But this is something that has come up with the presidential election now, you've yeah. endorsed President Donald Trump and you want to see him win another term. But now you see that the life activists have gone after him and said that he's not, he's pro choice now, he's not pro life. But isn't it Donald Trump who got these justices on who overturned Roe v. Wade, which is what they wanted, but now they want it to go back to the federal government? Well, look, I think, I think for the, the activists who want the federal government to, to, federal government or Supreme Court to make the final decision, I just think that's the wrong approach. Um, again, I, and I would always tell the Democrats this as well. Medical procedures are governed by the 50 states. The federal government doesn't, doesn't govern medical procedures for the entire country. We don't do that. They're governed by state law. Abortion, as distasteful as I think it is, is a medical procedure. So its proper place is at the state level where people have much more access to their state legislature and their governor than they would actually be able to have at the federal level because it's much more of a, of a personal issue, much more of a, obviously medical procedures are personal. I think when it comes to the presidential election, I think people need to understand on the Republican side of the aisle, Donald Trump, frankly, is the first Republican president I've seen who on the campaign trail said, I'm going to do these things, then got elected and actually did them. After that, I don't even know what you're looking for anymore. Like, just tell me the menu and then go do it. He did right. it. He did it in 2015, 2016, came into office and did it. He has a whole menu of things that he's looking to do right now. One of the big ones is cleaning out the, dip, the deep state, cleaning out these parts of the federal bureaucracy that are weaponized against the American people. I know he's committed to that. Talk to him enough about it. He wants to see that done. But on a broader perspective, and this is not just specifically uh, with abortion, from a foreign policy perspective, our country is in a very precarious uh, place. And mm -hmm. there is one person who can step in day one and get us back on track with our rivals ac across the globe, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. He could step in day one and just look at them and say, all right, fellas, enough's enough. I'm back. Here's what America's going to do. Well, and we need that type of leadership across the globe. We've lost a lot of ground with foreign policy in the last two years. You look at the president of France going over and meeting with China and, and saying that they can work with China. This is our oldest ally that is now saying, eh, maybe they're the leaders of the world. I mean, that's they're indicating that they feel more comfortable believing that China will be the strongest country in the world rather than the United States. That is a that is a serious change of events. And, and that really turns the world upside down. It's incredibly dangerous. Is that the main reason you chose Donald Trump over Ron DeSantis? Obviously, Ron DeSantis hasn't announced yet, but all signs point to he's going to. A lot of people said, whoa, people in Florida are saying that they'd go with Donald Trump over Ron DeSantis. So do you think that the foreign policy part of it is the, the number one reason? 
Uh, yeah, it, it's the biggest one. They're all important, but it's the biggest one, especially looking at the way Joe Biden has represented us on the world stage. You know, the Democrats always love to say, uh, oh, if Donald Trump had won, we would have World War Three. But look at the facts. He became president. The world actually got safer. Our position in the world was stronger. And so everything was actually clicking on all cylinders for America until some some virus got leaked out of a lab in Wuhan. And yes, we now know it was leaked out of a lab in Wuhan. And so that's the only thing you can say about his presidency, unless you want to get into the stupid narrative stuff from the political left, which I just don't bother engaging in because they just want to level accusations so they can, they can accomplish their agenda. That's what they do. I think, but you look at energy exploration in our country, securing the border. And I also state another big one, going in and cleaning out the federal agencies. You have somebody in Donald Trump who it's clear now elements of our government were weaponized against him, slow walking his agenda, demonizing him in the press, leaking to the press and to the, Demo to the Democrat political establishment and some of those outside groups. They were working to undermine his presidency the entire time. You're going to need a president with who's mission minded to go in there and clean that stuff out because it's not just about President Trump and his presidency. It's about the future of the country. If they'll do that to him, they'll do that to Ron DeSantis. They'll do it to Tudor Dixon. They'll do it to anybody else. That's what I've tried to explain to people. The next Republican will be just as viciously, viciously attacked. If you look at his record, a lot of the things that he did were bipartisan. You look at the USMCA, you look at, I mean, at the time, even Operation Warp Speed, you look at the First Step Act, all of these things were very bipartisan. And he was able to accomplish more than, than most presidents have. And like you said, he kept his promises, but he was so viciously attacked by the media I have folks that are in both camps that are saying, but we don't think the Republican can win because they obviously think that there's too much baggage with Donald Trump, that people have attacked him relentlessly, that he can't come back from that. On the flip side, you, you mentioned uh, COVID coming from the, the lab and over the weekend or, or late last week, I think it was Minnesota that came out and said they're going to pass a law that you can't say certain things, which is absolutely unconstitutional. And you can be held accountable if you have misinformation. And, and one of those things is that COVID came from a lab. But on the flip side of that, I've had people say, well, DeSantis is just the other side of that. I've actually had people say to me, DeSantis is what everybody thought Donald Trump would be, but it's really happening with DeSantis because you look at some of the things that he's done. He went after the liquor license of a hotel in Miami. Now, I don't know that he was able to get the liquor license, but they had a drag show. He said he was going to take the liquor license because of this. He said that it was a, against the law. And I've got some Republicans who are saying to me, eh, I'm afraid that once you start getting that deeply involved in private businesses, that you're going too far. What do you say to that? Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, with respect to the liquor license situation, I think what their angle was, what the governor's office was saying, is that you couldn't bring minors into, into an establishment like that. And because they were serving alcohol at the same time, you were actually endangering the minor. I think, I think that's the path where they were trying to go. There is a way to get there, uh, but it's pretty difficult. Look, I, my position is you have to hold the left accountable. If you have companies that are left wing, i.e. Disney, who now we all know are literally trying to seep their own political agenda into all of their media and then, and all of their, their, their entertainment. If they then want to use their voice to go against state government, then state government should, you know, do, do a wrap against their wrists if they try to step out of line, not to put them at a disadvantage of other businesses. But let's be very clear. Disney had a special disp dispensation that put them ahead of Universal, that put them ahead of Legoland here in Florida. So if you're going to try to use your corporate power, frankly, to lie about the governor and the legislature's uh uh, parental choice and education, parental rights and education bill, then yeah, why are we giving you a special taxing district? I think that's the, uh, that's about the end of where you take that, that kind of battle. On a broader perspective, we as Republicans, we have to be careful. Um, we want to respect rights. Obviously we do. We respect free speech. We want everybody to live in harmony and peace, but we also have to understand the game that's being uh, launched against us. You have activist groups who are challenging these corporations. You have employees who are being organized politically, 
who are pushing these the C-suite to make these statements and do these various things. And then you have these corporations then turning their eyes and starting to go after uh, the political environment in various states. So why not go after that, actually? What what you're talking about, why as governor, why not, in, and even in the federal government, why not go after that? These banks that are saying you will be deplatformed, all of these places that are threatening businesses, to be deplatformed and really taking away that ability for capitalism. Because, you know, my opinion, and I've heard a lot of people say this is, gosh, if you start to go woke, if you start to do what Bud Light has done or Alta or Disney, then capitalism could take care of that because people will say, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to pay $15,000 a week to go to Disney if you're going to tell my kids that they should do this, this and this. But we're going after individual businesses. Why not go after those platforms that say you must do this or you no longer get to bank? Why not go after that? Actually, I think that's a that's a good point. It's something at the federal level we're starting to look at. Uh, I'm actually on the ESG working group where we're digging into these various issues and whether that's reining in the SEC uh, who's trying to push all this stuff through rulemaking. It's pretty insidious. You have SEC chairman and Gary Gensler who's creating all these rules out of thin air. Congress never gave him the ability to do it, to force corporate America to disclose all these actions, some of which the woke corporations are pushing forward. And it's because the woke corporations are pushing it. They're saying everybody has to be a part of this mm-hmm. game. And that's the stuff at the federal level we're trying to unwind and say, no, you can't do that. You have the state of material things. You have to be focused, frankly, on your fiduciary responsibility, which is earning money for your shareholders, et cetera. I think if you go to this whole thing about people being deplatformed, that's another area, especially in a financial system, where at the federal level, we have to engage in that because you are hampering and you're, and you're, you're causing damage to interstate commerce. I think that's the appropriate use of law where you go back in and you clearly lay out what the rules of the roads are, of the road are, that the fiduciary responsibility absolutely matters first, second, and third. And this, this novel, ridiculous concept of stakeholder capitalism makes no sense at all because what you end up doing is having a company get off the main mission and get into these other areas where they actually hurt their business model. Disney has hurt themselves in this right. stuff. People have not been subscribing to Disney Plus. I was a Disney Plus subscriber. I canceled my subscription. Subscription a lot of families did. We all saw what happened with Bud Light. Now the other person is now on on leave or whatever the case is going on. Uh you mentioned Delta, uh Nike. Nike's going to have that problem too because there are a lot of people saying, "I'm not giving you guys like money if you're going to like shove this stuff down our throat." I think it does work, but you got to have Republican politicians who point this stuff out and do everything they can from a legal perspective to set the playing field correctly and not allow the radical left to use our constitution and to use our capitalist system to undermine it. Yeah, because I think there's so much behind the scenes that people don't see. And I think sometimes when we say we'll go after one individual, we don't go after the seedy underbelly, then it continues to happen and people don't realize it. And I think this is even happening on a greater level when you talk about activism and groups that are fighting. You have school choice groups. Some school choice groups, some school choice activists have had these people that go after them. I know one person who has someone that goes after him on all of his social media. So they go, you know, PayPal, do you know that this person does this and they're an activist? And they've been deplatformed personally from Cash App, from PayPal, from all of the online payment systems. And he's like, my life has been totally destroyed by these people. And I want to be able to say, you can't do this. You cannot force people to deplatform platform someone because of their political views. Do you think that's something that can happen? Because I think it's, I mean, it's just annihilating Republicans and conservatives. I think so. And I think there's a pathway to get there. The thing to be careful about is now is the arm of government being used to decide which company is good, which company is bad, which is why I say you have to, in a lot of respects, reset the playing field of what what is a fiduciary standard. I think that's the, the right place to land. Because then if you clearly state out what the fiduciary standard is, whether it's federal law or state law, frankly, I think it should be in both places, then it puts the companies on notice that you actually have to do what's in the best interest of the company and not using the the power, the corporate power 
to wield against your political opponents. This is one of these things where, you know, Republicans, we're late to the game on this. We're figuring all this stuff out on the fly (laughs) during COVID-19. Meanwhile, the radical left, they have been positioning themselves to do these things. You have somebody like AOC who basically said that, oh, it's great that Tucker Carlson lost his job. Deplatforming works. I think that's insidious and reprehensible. Our country relies on people being able to speak their mind and to have their opinions and have their beliefs and have it respected regardless if you agree or not. And I think I would, when that moves I would argue economics, that on terrible. a lot of this technology stuff, we're late to the game, even when yeah. it comes to ground game and, and elections and all of that. I would say that we're just figuring out what Silicon Valley has known and been helping the Democrats with for a long time. But I want to, before I let you go, I want to go to something else because sure. I know Joe Biden announced his run for presidency. You know, he had to pre-record it because- Obviously, it's a struggle to get through three minutes for Joe Biden. So he pre-recorded it and he went after MAGA Republicans hard. And he went after saying that, you know, they're they're making it harder for people to vote. All of these baloney statements. He really didn't have anything, nothing pro-Biden, nothing. I've done this. It was all against what he called MAGA Republicans, the new boogeyman. What's your response to that? I think Joe Biden's terrible at his job. Personally, he's he's he sucks as a president. So this is all he's got. And, you know, his new code code word of MAGA Republicans, like, I guess I'm a MAGA Republican, I'm a Tea Party Republican, whatever you want to say. But the truth is, MAGA Republicans, we're the ones who are actually fighting for the soul of America. We don't want an America where you have elements of our government suppressing free speech. We don't want an America where the Treasury Department is going to be looking in your bank account, seeing how you spend your money. We don't want an America with 80,000 more IRS agents who are frankly going after middle-income Americans, making sure people who are in the gig economy are issued 1099s and then going after all their money. We don't want that. We don't want an America where our border is wide open and fentanyl is killing 80,000 people a year in our country and you have young girls being sold into sex slavery. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we don't want. We want a free-flowing economy. We want people to be respected and for tolerance to reign in our country. We want to live in harmony and peace. Um, but the reason why he can't say any of those things in his in his entry video is because he doesn't believe them. You see, Joe Biden believes in an America where his radical uh, kook staffers at the White House, they're the ones who decide for everybody else. And for the young voters in America who, you know, watch TikTok and get caught up with these influencers who frankly don't even know what they're talking about, understand that Joe Biden and the radical left, they don't want you to decide things for yourself. They want you to sit down and listen and be told what to do. Republicans want a society where your choices are your own and you live and you live by your choices and you earn money and you earn prosperity and you have a flourishing life. Well, you mentioned tolerance and peace and they're pushing that. But your own family has experienced the intolerance of the left. You're a black American. Your Your wife is a white American. That for some reason seems to be an issue with them. Yeah, it is. It's actually kind of interesting because they swear that they're the ones who are fighting for everybody's rights. But then at the same time, they get upset about my marital situation. I don't really get into that because if you start to look at the country, you're seeing a lot more mixed marriages in the country. Everybody sees it. And a lot of these young kids that we talk about, they go to school with black kids, white kids, Hispanic kids at their age. They don't even engage in this stuff, but it is the political class that tries to make it an issue. It's it's these people who are these political influencers on the left who try to say, oh, see, he's not really black because look at his wife. I would actually tell those people that um, they wouldn't say it to my say, my face because if they actually met me in public and saw me, they would be like, nah, I don't think I'm going to talk to him. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just being honest. It's just, they just wouldn't do it personally. They like to do it on Twitter uh, where nobody knows who they are. They hide behind you know, some fictitious name, whatever. But I don't really care about what they say. I look at what happens when I deal with people. You know, people in the country, we're large, we're good to each other. People just want to be respected and they just want to live in peace. And I think that that's the America that I want to see, you know, and and, and one last thing I'll say, and you mentioned it a while ago, but I'm going to go back. For Republicans who are concerned about who's going to be our nominee and and what what is this going to mean, understand We have to get in the game. And the real game is the Democrats support their candidate no matter what. Like I said, John Fetterman's in the U.S. Senate and they knew that man was not capable of doing the job, but they wanted his vote. 
When our nominating process is done, I'm supporting Donald Trump. We're one party. Everybody has to get on board and get the job done because it's about the country. It's not about your feelings. It's not about who you think you would like. It's about the most effective person to get the country back on track. I think that's I think that's Donald Trump. Well, that's a smart message. I appreciate you sharing that. Definitely, if we could unite around our candidates, we see that in Michigan with the Democrats right now. Alyssa Slotkin has come out and said she's going to run for U.S. Senate. She is the only person everybody has agreed that's the person. That's that's great when you see that kind of unity supporting a candidate. And I agree, once we get that nominee, we've got to be all in. So Thank you. Thank you for your wise words today. And thank you for all of the work you do for us in the federal government. Congressman Byron Donalds, I appreciate having you. Hey, no problem. And as a tutor, if it's you in Michigan, you and Alyssa, you know, give me a call. Get at me. (laughs) I don't know if I'm ready for that yet, but you know what? I'm going to be helping on the ground. All of that technology that we need, I'm going to help bring that in so that we can make sure that we have Republicans across the board. Sure. Of course. Anyway, thanks for having me on. It was great. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for joining me on the Tudor Dixon podcast. For this episode and others, go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there and make sure you join us the next time on the Tudor Dixon podcast. Have a great day.